Good morning, campers. It's time to get up. We'll see you at the flagpole in just a few minutes. That's how I've started every day the last week. We, uh, we had a fantastic week at camp. 85 campers and 45 staff and uh, good weather except for when the parents got there. Parents show up and the rain came, so uh, both times. But uh, yeah, I said parents, they just bring the, the clouds and the rain. But no, we had a, a fantastic week. I, I had a whole lot of nervousness about directing a week of camp that I dearly loved. I didn't want to mess it up. And, um, but it, it didn't get messed up. It went very well. Had a great staff that uh, covered up all my mistakes, so that's even nicer. And uh, it just went well. I'm glad to be glad to go. Appreciate everybody covering and, and helping with, with the so that I could be there. Why won't this microphone connect? There we go. Sorry. I am running on pretty low sleep, so I can do one thing at a time, and that's it. No multitasking available till I get some more sleep. But we, uh, our Henderson kids showed up really big. That was really neat. We had uh, some of our folks on staff as well. Next year, I'm going to come back to more of you, but uh, we had a, a great, great week. And uh, I'm just very appreci appreciative of all the help. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 here in just a minute. Let's start off with a prayer, though. Oh, God, our Father, we are so grateful for the blessings that you give, grateful to be here, grateful to gather together to worship. I thank you for our church family right here at Henderson, and God, we're grateful for our church family the world over. As today is your day, we pray that we will honor and glorify you in our worship, just as we seek to honor and glorify you in everything we say and do each day of our lives. Lord, thank you for your word as we look into it today and talk about faith and faithfulness. I pray that you'll bless our study time. Guide us and go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I appreciate Adam teaching and, and preaching, and he told me he was not going to pick up the verse by verse. I freely admit I have not had a chance to watch his uh, lesson while I was gone. There, there's just a little bit of cell signal at camp, but not enough and not enough time to watch lessons, so I'm going to do that uh, this week. But Adam said he was not going to pick up the verse by verse, so my notes say we're in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Um, so let's, uh, let's pick up there. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, we're kind of at the, the top, the pinnacle of his argument, his theological argument uh, of what we need to do now. He's kind of moved into that first step of because of everything we've said that Jesus is so great, here's what we need to do. And he's encouraging these folks and he says in verse 35, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. He says these earthly Christians, in fact, verse 34, he said, you guys have suffered the loss of all kinds of earthly goods. You know, you're, you, uh, you have suffered loss, not yet to the point of shedding blood, we'll find out, but they, they had suffered all kinds of, of loss of their earthly goods because they knew that there was something better. And he says, so you don't mind losing some things and you need to know what's keep, you know, what, what's a, a keep and what's a pitch kind of item, right? When we sort stuff out at our house, we try to sort it out to keep, pitch, and donate. And, and so he, he says, make sure as you're going through the, that, you know, material possessions, you can put that in the pitch pile or the donate pile, either one. But make sure when you get to your faith, your confidence, that stays in the keep pile. He says, so you have need, or for, he says, don't cast away your confidence. Don't throw it away, literally. And that's kind of an interesting idea. How did they lose their personal goods back in verse 34 there in 35, or verse 34, sorry. How did they lose their personal goods? Cherry? Yeah, say so sometimes if you, as Judaism and Christianity formalized their split, if you were a good Jew and you became a Christian, your family had your funeral for you. 
but they cut you out of the will. They cut you off. You were out of the family business. You were off the family land. And so sometimes you lost it that way. We know they faced persecution from the outside as well. And, and so sometimes Rome or a local government kind of part of Rome would, would make it such that if you were a Christian, it was really hard to do business. We also know sometimes the business community did that. In lots of areas, part of being a member of one of the trade guilds meant you had to worship the idol that was the patron and god of that trade guild. And Christians said, we can't do that. And the trade guild would say, well, then you can't be a part of the trade guild. And if you're not a part of the guild, you're not certified. And if you're not certified, people won't do business with you. And so they had suffered loss. But in all those cases, those things were taken from them. Their, their earthly possessions, their, their, in some cases their land, their business, that was all taken away from them by force. And he says, be careful when folks take stuff away from you that you don't throw away your confidence. Notice the difference. Nobody can take your confidence away from you, but you can throw it away. You, you can surrender it. You can give it up. He says, don't, take away, don't, don't cast away your confidence. Why not? He says, because that has great reward. While losing your earthly goods, that, that, that costs you something. But he says, your, earthly, or your confidence has a great reward. And he says that in the present tense. I like that. He says, there's a great reward here and now. We're talking about eternity. But he said, there's a great reward to holding on to your confidence. And he uses that word confidence to talk about continuing to serve Christ with boldness, continuing to hold on to their faith. And he says, and it's the same word, by the way, that he's going to use, or that he used in chapter four to talk about how we approach the throne room of God. We approach with confidence. He said, don't throw that confidence away. He says in verse 30, 36, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. He says, you're going to need that confidence because that confidence is going to produce what? I'm on like four hours of sleep every night. I guarantee y'all can't be as tired as I am. So let's talk a little because I can't fall asleep in my own Bible class. He says you're going to need your confidence because you have need of what? Well, you're going to want that reward. But then in verse 36, you're going to need that. He says, you know, the, the reward, you're going to want that. That's something that, that's a, a valuable benefit. But he said you're about to need endurance. And if you don't have, or, or perseverance, yeah, if you don't have that confidence, you won't persevere. You won't endure. You won't be able to make it. That, that word endurance, the Greek word there is upomone. It's the word we get patience from. Uh, the old King James called it long suffering. And, and uh, you know, that, that's a good way to look at patience. This past week we had, uh, because camp was off last year, Almost half my campers, when I said, hey, how many of you, this is your first week at camp, about half my crowd raised their hand, and all my staff went, oh boy, because <laughs> we love our campers, and they're great, but that first year away from camp, they get homesick a lot, and when they get homesick, campers have two reactions when they get homesick. One is, they're going to sull up and cry and get mad and pitch a fit, and I want to go home. The other one is, okay, if mom and dad aren't here, I'm going to look for somebody to play mom and dad. I'm going to look for a fill-in this week. And that's usually their counselor. And when that camper decides, you know what, this week, your mom or your dad, they come up, and they got to be within about four inches of you at all times, constantly. We had a, a, a little kid who, he missed mom and dad a lot. Missed his sister a lot. I was like, dude, what's, that, that's weird. Nobody misses their sibling, but his sister's like eight years older, so that made it a little different. But, uh, man, he was homesick a lot. And at night, he wanted to tell his counselor about it all night long. <laughs> and he would go over, and, and if his counselor was laying in bed, he'd tap him on the shoulder. And so they made a rule. You get three times to do that. And they were all going to sleep. And he said, I wonder if he meant that. So he came over on the fourth time and he started tapping. And the counselor said to himself, you know what, I told him three times. The counselor kept his eyes closed, worked really hard to keep his breathing nice and slow. He's like, I'm asleep. That's what we're all doing. I'm asleep. Hey, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan. Hey, Mr. Ryan. He said, it so happened, I saw him get out of bed, and I looked down at my phone, so I knew what time he got out of bed. And I waited until he quit tapping. 17 minutes. 
17 minutes he stood there tapping. You want to talk about patience, long suffering? That was, he didn't just do that one night either, all right? So when you talk about long suffering, sometimes patience really is. I suffer for a long period of time. There's an endurance. It's a test of perseverance to, to lower, you know, for, for those campers to learn what they needed. For us in our faith, long suffering, endurance, perseverance, there's a lot of similarities that it's not fun and enjoyable. It is suffering. There, there's a trial part to that. And the writer of Hebrews says, you Christians, you're going to undergo some suffering. And, and, and you're going to need patience. You know how that counselor could endure? He's like, this kid is eight years old. He's going to give it up and go to bed at some point. He had a confidence, I'm going to get through this. I can outweigh him. He just knew that he could. There was a confidence that gave him endurance. So, the writer of Hebrews says, don't throw away your confidence because if you do, you won't be able to endure. Whenever we go through trials that are way more serious than just a kid at camp, if I have a confidence in God, a confidence in what God's done for me in Jesus, I can endure, I can persevere, I can hang in there, I can suffer long because you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promises. You see, there, there's, there's your confidence, and it has this great reward. That's a promise from God. But what is in between me and that great reward? What does he say I have to do first? You got to read your Bibles on this one. When do I get the promise? After I've done the will of God. What happens if I throw away my confidence and I lose my endurance? I won't be able to do the will of God. And then I won't get the promise. I won't be able to live out my faith. If I give up, if I quit, if I walk away, I won't be able to live that life of faith. And while that promise is there and it's mine, if I throw it away, I don't get it anymore. So our task is to keep on doing the will of God because if we stop short, if we give up, if we throw away our faith, we won't get the promise. See, it wasn't God's will for those Christians to suffer. That's not what he means. But it was his will to reward them greatly for what they went through. And so in verse 37 of Hebrews 10, he, he quotes there a couple of different verses. He kind of takes two Old Testament verses and merges them together, one from Isaiah and one from Habakkuk. By the way, personally, I'm just going to tell you, I think that's because the New Testament writers had some sense of their inspiration. Paul seems to talk about that, that he knows he can speak with an authority from God. And so while you and I should justifiably be hesitant about cutting and choosing our Bible verses, they understood that what they did was at the direction of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he takes a verse from Isaiah and a verse from Habakkuk and mashes them together to make a point by the inspiration of God. Verse 37 says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And again, that's from Isaiah chapter 26. And, and in Isaiah 26, the prophet is waiting for deliverance. He's looking for deliverance. And he knows just a little while, just a little while, and that deliverance will come. Hang in there is kind of the message of Isaiah. For yet a little while, he who's coming will come and will not tarry. I don't think Hebrews is talking about the, the day of the Lord, the, the day of final judgment. In the Old Testament, any day of God's judgment was regularly referred to as the day of the Lord. Joel talks about a day of God's judgment and he calls it the day of the Lord all the way throughout. And for most of it, he's talking about events that are going to happen in Israel, in the nation of Israel and to their enemies. And then at the very end, he talks about that there will come a time when God will do this to the whole world. But for most of it, the day of the Lord is a day of God's judgment against his own people who are faithless and against the enemies of God's people who are persecuting them. Isaiah had that same thing in mind with the Babylonians. He says, just hang in there. The day of the Lord will come yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Amos chapter 4, Amos had the same idea there. He revealed that the day of the Lord was the day that God would judge the Chaldeans. And even though it might seem a long way off, he says, wait for it because it's definitely going to come. All of that rolls into the New Testament when we talk about the second coming of Christ. And there does need to be an endurance that comes from that confidence. 
But right now he says, for just a little while and he who's coming, there's a judgment that's coming. We talked a lot about the history of the book of Hebrews. It is very obvious in the book of Hebrews that the temple is still standing and that worship is still happening at the temple. The Jews are still able to offer sacrifices. Historically, we know that only has a matter of a few years at best maybe two years before the temple is destroyed and that Jewish system of worship is done away with, practically speaking, because there was no temple anymore, no opportunity to offer sacrifices. I think that's what he's talking about here. There's a day of judgment that's coming. You Jewish Christians who are torn, should I go back to Judaism? Should I hang in there with my Christian faith? Maybe 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 my Jewish faith was right. He said, hang in there. Because it's going to be crystal clear what God's will is here very soon. When the temple's destroyed, it's obvious we can't continue practicing Judaism. He who's coming will come and will not tarry. So what do we do now, Mr. Hebrews writer? Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You see there a reference from Habakkuk chapter 2, 3 and 4. The just, the righteous one, during the wait, we live by faith. No matter what happens, we live by faith. Paul uses that same verse in Romans chapter 1 to to introduce his whole idea about faith. And, And really, Hebrews and Romans both emphasize remaining faithful to obtain the life that God has promised. So in a little while, the temple is going to be destroyed. It'll be very clear what God's will is. For now, live by faith. Make sure that that you trust God. Habakkuk is this great book, a little tiny book in the Minor Prophets. Um, When when you want to give folks, uh, give the kids a a nice Bible spelling bee, Habakkuk's always one of those final round words because there's a lot of K's in there. So he says in Habakkuk, Habakkuk comes and he says, God, your people aren't acting like your people. How is it you let all these folks say, we're the people of God, and they go out and they oppress people and they don't live by your commands? And Habakkuk's kind of mad. And maybe you've been frustrated by that too sometimes. You know, you see the headlines, prominent Christian, da, 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 and it never ends well, you know. Christian minister, it doesn't end well, or, or, or whatever, or a church that gets in trouble. And you say, God, how can people wear your name and do all that stuff? Well, Habakkuk says that. And God answers Habakkuk's question. He says, Habakkuk, don't worry. There's a group coming from the north like you have never heard of. They're going to come through and they're going to absolutely annihilate my people. Take them over, take them captive. I'm going to punish all these folks who've left me. And Habakkuk says, whoa, I just meant like, can you get the bad folks in trouble? Not can you destroy our nation or something? God, we're your people. How could you let folks who are even more evil than us take us over? How does a good God let that happen? And at the very end of Habakkuk, this beautiful prayer of Habakkuk, as he works through all of this of how can bad things happen? And God says, well, there's worse things that are going to happen. He said, how can those things happen? And God says, what you need to know is I'm in control. And Habakkuk reaches this this moment, this point where he says, I get it now. I don't have to understand all this. This is more than I don't even know about these, this army that's coming. But I know you're in control so Habakkuk writes this beautiful prayer. And he says, you know what? If the fig trees don't blossom, if the crops don't come in, if all the stalls in the barn are empty, I'm still going to trust God. Because that's the best choice I can make. It's a beautiful, poetic prayer of Habakkuk at the end. If you haven't read it, you should. But Habakkuk says, the just shall live by faith. What do I need to do? I need to trust God. And Habakkuk starts out by saying, what about all these people who aren't living right? And Habakkuk says, the the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In other words, if I give up on my faith, I become just like all those people I was complaining about. So I've got to hold on to my faith. The just shall live by faith. God will avenge. He'll avenge his own. He'll punish the proud and, and all of that. But if I want to be the righteous one, then I can't shrink back. Because if I shrink back, God has no pleasure in that. No pleasure in the unfaithful. So the choice is really evident. Live by faith or revert to Judaism. That's your choice. And they said, well, no, no, no. We want to have Jewish faith. And he said, you can't do both. You're either going to trust God or you're going to go back to what you think is the right thing. You're going to trust you or trust God. See, when they became a Christian, they declared, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. To go back to Judaism, they'd have to deny that. And and the writer of Hebrews says, your choice is, are you going to hold on to your faith that Jesus is who he claimed to be? 
Or are you going to give it up and go back? You can't have both. And remember, God is looking for faith. The just shall live by faith. And anyone who draws back, anyone who turns back, anyone who shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And then the writer of Hebrews says, you know what? That's not who we are, church. Look at verse 39. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. In case you wondered what he meant by drawing back, what's the end result of drawing back? Perdition, yeah. The end result is we're not of those who draw back and lose our salvation. We're of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We realize there's a salvation that's out there. The one who endures to the end, that's the one who will be saved. And I love that, that there's an encouragement there. He says, this is not us. The writer, you know, Habakkuk was worried about, about uh, Jewish folks who would, would throw away their faith, who would shrink back. He said, but that's not who we are, church. And, and he's writing to these Hebrew Christians they were wrestling with. And he says, I know you're going to do the right thing. I was reminded of how Paul writes to Philemon. And he says, I know you're going to do this. I know I don't have to command you. I just need to tell you it's the right thing to do. And I know who you are, Philemon. You're, you're going to do this. Because you do the right thing. There's such an encouragement there. And so he encourages them to be faithful. And then he speaks to Jewish Christians. And he, set, he sets up this, lots of folks call Hebrews chapter 11 the, the hall of fame. Real quickly, go to Hebrews chapter 12. Just skip chapter 11 because I want you to see this. And in so doing, I'm going to tell you a little preacher secret. So just keep it between us and the live stream anyway, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Chapter 10 ends with this call. In chapter 10, he finishes up by saying, we're not those who draw back, who shrink back. We're of those who, who believe and endure. And chapter 12 picks right up on that. You know what chapter 11 is, right? It's a sermon illustration. I, I really think Hebrews was, a, was originally a sermon. That's just my opinion after study, and that, that's not revealed in there. But Hebrews reads and feels like it was designed to be delivered in one unit. It, it was designed as a sermon. And, and so chapter 11 is a sermon illustration. It, it helps you just say, let's pull over and park here for a minute and dig down on this point. You can leave it out and the message, the continuity of the message stays the same. But Hebrews 11 helps us really understand what he's talking about. And, and so Hebrews 11 is this faith hall of fame. I've told some of y'all before, Heather's great-grandfather uh, played in the NFL right when it was beginning. Scored points every which way you could score points, but his position was offensive lineman. If you're a football player, you know that's pretty impressive then. So uh, he's an offensive lineman that has field goals to his name. But, but Russell Hathaway's jersey hangs in Canton as part of a display about the team that he played on when he was part of the Pottsville Maroons. And, and here is the Faith Hall of Fame. Okay, we went to Canton because we wanted to see Grandpa's jersey. We thought that was pretty neat. Here's the Faith Hall of Fame. For these Jews, these are folks like, we want to see these people. These are folks that we've looked forward to seeing them all our lives. This is, we hope to spend eternity with them. And he goes through this list. And he says, here's what faith looks like. I told you, we're people who, who believe to the saving of the soul. Here's what it looks like. And he goes back to all these heroes that they would have had. He says in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He says faith is the substance. Faith is the reality. That, that word substance, it, it refers to a, a precipitate in a chemical reaction. That's the hard stuff that falls out to the bottom. If you took some, some rocks and some mud Imagine where I've seen rocks and mud lately. But if you took rocks and mud and some water and you mixed them all up and swirled them all up, for a moment there, they're all just spinning around. But at some point, the substance settles out of that. You do that in a nice glass jar and swirl it all around, and after a while, you'll hear that gravel, plink, 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 it's hitting the bottom. It settles out. 
If you leave it long enough, the dirt will settle out to the bottom. That's the word for this. You look at life and here's this big swirl of life. Well, what's, what's the substance of it? What's real in there? What's heavy in there? What has weight? It's faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the solid stuff of life, a world that's often muddy, that's often changing, a world that says, we don't know if we can define anything. It's all subjective. Faith is reality. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The idea that, that I have hope, that I look forward to something, and, and here is faith that is what I hold on to right now. Hope looks forward. Faith is right here today, and it's tied, it's attached to that hope. Faith is what already possesses in the present what God has promised in the future. In fact, uh, the same word there, upostasis, is used back in the very beginning of Hebrews chapter 1 to talk about Jesus. He is the substance of God. So wait a minute, how's that work? Because theologically, you can get into some shaky ground really fast. Jesus was the one that showed up. Jesus is God in the flesh. You can see him, you can touch him, you can hear him, you can see his miracles. You could spit on him, you could nail him to a cross, you could pierce his side. He was the substance of God. He was right here and now. And faith is the right here and now of everything we hope for. All that we look forward to as Christians, all that our hope holds on to in the future, faith is what shows up in the here and now today. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's to be able to enjoy today what God has promised us. But it's not just the substance of our hope. It's the evidence of things not seen. Man, don't we get this? I feel like we get this even more than maybe those Hebrew Christians got it in some ways. You think it's kind of weird that they believed in gods and all this stuff? They'd look up at the stars and they'd see pictures. And you ever looked at the stars and tried to see all those constellations? You got to have a little map to say, oh, that's okay. There's Orion's belt, right? We find the three in a row. There's Orion's belt. You wonder, how did they ever see all that stuff? That wasn't really there. And then you go and you put your mask on and your hand sanitize. And, and, and you wash your hands to take good care. Of that. Why do you do all that stuff? Why do you wear a mask and hand sanitizer? And why do you do all that stuff? What are you afraid of? Invisible virus, germs. Anybody ever seen germs? You know, the first guy who proposed germs, they laughed at him. That's a dumb idea that there's stuff out there we can't see that can hurt us. And then they did a little more research. They said, oh, there's stuff out there we can't see that can hurt us, and we should do stuff about it. And so today, long before we ever worried about a virus for the last year and a half, that kind of really supercharged it. But man, we've been, you know, any doctor that goes in, can you imagine? Imagine the day before they knew about germs. Doctor comes in out of the field, his hands are messy and dirty, and he picks up a saw and walks over and says, let's do surgery. And we think, how could you do that? Well, they didn't think germs were real, but now we believe in germs. Well, we understand. And whether you want to talk about seeing patterns in the stars and believing there's stuff out there, we all believe in things we can't see that impact our life. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Just like that doctor who proposed the idea that there were germs and he could prove that and set up by his experiments to prove that there was something there. And at that point, before they ever had an electron microscope or anything else, he could prove, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know there's something there that causes infection, and we need to do something about it. In the same way, spiritually, we say there's more than just what you see in this life. And faith is proof of that. It's the evidence of things not seen. In fact, the theme of Hebrews 11 is by faith. People did stuff that makes absolutely no sense, and it worked. Why did it work? Sherry, I'm going to use you as an example. Can I, can I have your permission on that? No, that's, that's perfect. Sherry said exactly what I was hoping somebody would say. Why did it work? By faith. They believed, right? So when that kid at camp says, I believe that, that I can climb the, the big old 
30 foot tall fence and jump off the top of it. And if I flap my arms really hard, I'll fly. Man, he believes that with all his heart. How come we don't let him do it? Maybe because I don't believe. Well, because his belief is not enough. But how come when a bird perches on the top of that 30 foot tall fence and jumps off of it and flaps his arms, he takes off and flies? He's designed to do it. Who designed him that way? God did. So Sherry says, why did it work? Well, because they believed. It's not just because they believed. We can believe wrong. We can believe something that's not true. But they believed in God. And so how is faith the evidence of things hoped for? Because when faith works, it proves I've trusted in something that's really there. When these people do stuff that makes no sense and everybody says, that'll never work. And they say, well, God told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And it works. You know, when, when the Israelites march around the city of Jericho and they say, you know what, if we run laps around this wall, it'll fall down. And everybody says, that never works. Do you guys not understand physics and how walls work? They're like, we understand God. And everybody but Rahab in the city said, that's crazy. There is no God. And the Israelites marched around and then they screamed at the walls. And what did the walls do? They fell down. Now there's folks out there who try to say, oh no, no, the Israelites screamed at just the right frequency and there were just enough of them that the sonic waves cracked the wall. Man, you know that's baloney before they even get done, don't you? Why did the walls fall down? Because they believed? Because God knocked the walls down. Why did the walls fall down when Israel did what they did? Well, that's because Israel believed that God could knock the walls down and so they did what he said. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Can you imagine when the walls of Jericho fell down, how many people said, whoa, maybe there is something to this God. But there's only one person in all of Jericho that makes the Faith Hall of Fame. Who is it? We're going to read about her. Rahab. She's the only one who, before they ever did anything, she said, I believe your God can knock the walls of this city down. We're all scared to death of y'all, but we think the walls are going to hold. But I don't. I think your God is the one true God. That's what she told the spies. And I think your God is worth obeying more than my king of Jericho. And that's what she did. By faith, when she believed, she gave evidence to things that were not seen yet. Was Jericho going to fall to God? Yeah, but it hadn't happened yet, but she believed it. Her faith was the evidence of things that hadn't been seen yet. I skipped ahead and borrowed from one that he's going to use. But look at what he says. Faith is the substance. Faith is the reality of what I hope for. She had hope in her heart, but when she had to choose, am I going to hide these spies? Am I going to do the right thing? Am I going to send them out and tell them how to avoid the patrols? Faith was substance to her hope. Faith was evidence of what was not yet seen. For by it, verse 2, the elders obtained... A good testimony. Faith is not just some blind leap. We talk sometimes about a leap of faith. That's that kid jumping off the fence. Just, I'm going to trust God to catch me. That's not faith. Faith is based on evidence. It's not a leap into a dark. It's a trust in God and following him. It's a realistic trust in God. It says, I believe God is real and I believe he really works in this life. We can't prove God like we would prove a stone exists, but we have valid reasons for our faith. It's not just I believe because I want to believe. I read this analogy. It's like spending money out of a trust fund. If somebody comes to you and they said, hey, we've got, pick a number, $100,000. It's all invested in the stock market. And a few years from now, it's going to be yours. Would you go out and spend that $100,000? Would you go out and spend $100,000 exactly? Some of y'all are shaking your head. I mean, stock market is doing pretty well right now. If it's worth $100,000 right now, or, or, you know, let's make it more modern, right? Here's $100,000 in Bitcoin, that cryptocurrency that goes woo all over the place. Today, it's worth $100,000. Would you bank that it's still going to be worth $100,000 next year? 
I mean, it might be worth half a million. It might be worth five bucks. It's not dependable. You don't trust it. But faith is like saying, I've got $100,000 cash right here. And it's yours. It's not yours today, but it's guaranteed. It'll never be smaller than $100,000. Well, now I know I'm going to be $100,000 richer. Faith says God's not like the stock market. He may or may not be there as big as he promised. Faith is rock solid, certain God's going to be there. Jesus is a guarantee. And that is how the elders obtained a good testimony. The men of old, literally the word presbyteros there, it's the, it's the word elders. It's like we talk about elders in the church. We're going to see it talks about patriarchs like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham. They were commended not because they were talented. You might know how fast Abraham could run. I got no idea. How strong he was, we don't know, but we know he was a man of faith. I don't know how good Noah was at a, as a builder. He might not have been the best builder of his day, but he had faith. We know them for their faith, not for their talents or for their wealth or for their learning or for their worldly attainment. These elders, these men of old, they got a direct communication from God and they believed it and they obeyed it. We don't get direct communications from God like that anymore. He doesn't show up and give special messages to special people. What's our communication from God? It's the Word. It's the Bible. Yeah. I follow His Word. And we can believe the Bible just like they believe their communication from God. They were, they, they obtained a good testimony, a good witness. They're heroes. They got into the Hall of Fame because of faith. You and I, we're going to find out, we go to Hebrews 12, the Faith Hall of Fame is not closed for new nominations. You and I can be part of the Faith Hall of Fame. And we'll get in the same way they got in, by faith. By faith, verse 3, looks like this will be the last spot we'll get to, but that's all right. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which, were, which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Anybody see creation? Any of y'all present at creation and get to see it happen? Any of you know somebody who was around at creation and got to see it happen? We have zero eyewitness testimony from any human because there was no mankind yet. So how do we understand that the worlds were framed? We understand that by the word of God. We understand they were framed by the word of God, and we know that because the word of God tells us there's an element of faith there. And notice what he says, and this sure speaks to our current debate, but honestly, it's not new. We like to talk about how modern we are, and you want to talk about creation versus evolution and theistic evolution and all those different theories, Big Bang and how the world began and all that. Well, they had different names and different ideas, but in the days when the book of Hebrews was written, lots of people said, oh, no, 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 you don't understand, there was this great battle between the gods and the losers were killed, and the winners made the earth from, from their bodies. That was the Babylonian, basically the Babylonian idea. The, the loser god got ripped in half. Half of the loser god's body was made into earth. They dumped out the blood, that became the rivers. And then they shredded up the rest of it, and that became the sky and, and the, the seeds that would grow everything. The winner god made the earth from the loser god. And you say, that sounds crazy, and I'm sure they would say, you mean you think it all just happened, like bang, it just happened, and nobody caused the bang? They might look at us and say, y'all are crazy. But the truth is, the Bible says, by faith we, believe, we understand that, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Notice it doesn't say we understand how. Anybody know how God created well, yeah, he created ex nihilo. If you're really familiar with the arguments, that's Latin for out of nothing. It comes from this verse right here. The things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. God created from nothing. There was nothing, and when God spoke, it was there. One, uh, at one moment there was nothing, the next moment there was something, and God created out of nothing. You and I can't create out of nothing. I can open up a box of Legos and I can create, but i got to have the box of Legos, right? I can make some cool stuff with Legos, but i got to have the Legos. I can create from something. 
God creates something from nothing. And you say, how does he do that? I don't know. But I know that he does. By faith, I understand that the worlds were created. And I don't know how specifically all that worked. And you, you know, he says worlds here. And you're like, whoa, 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 there's more worlds. That was kind of their word for planets. Pretty cool. They had already figured out there must be some other planets out there. How do you make all those other planets? You know, we're exploring Mars, learning more about Mars. God took time to create Mars and all the rest of them and all the ones that we were able to see and beyond. I don't know how he did it all. Truthfully, I don't know why. Don't you think he could have just made Earth? Why do we need a Milky Way and a universe and all that? I don't know. But I believe he does, and I believe that he did. By faith, I believe in the beginning God created. I believe that that is just as absolutely certain as saying the sun rises in the east. We understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. What does it mean to say I believe in a creator God like that? When I, when I say I believe that, what am I believing in? Exactly his power. I believe in an all-powerful God, a God who can do stuff that is beyond my ability to even understand. He has the power to do creative acts at a, at a universal level. He has the power to create life. He has the power to create worlds. He, and he has the power to frame all of that, to set it up on a system, to make it work. I believe in an all-powerful God. Here's why that matters. If I believe in an all-powerful God, this past week, most of the time, they didn't get to pick teams. Almost all the activities, whatever cabin you're in, your cabin went out and played this or that. But occasionally, they got to pick teams. And when those kids got to pick teams, and they knew that we were picking teams for maybe a camper versus staff dodgeball game, who do you think they picked? They picked the big kids, the strong kids. They picked a fast kid or two who could really dodge well. They wanted to pick the best possible folks out there. They were playing dodgeball against the staff. We didn't even keep score. I mean, you got out, but sometimes we just say, I'll just go back in. Hebrews says, you're gambling with your soul here. You're making a choice for your eternal destiny. Who are you going to pick? When there's an all-powerful God out there in the lineup, you're not going to pick anybody else. You're not going to pick any other system. You're going to pick God. He's that big and that powerful. And starting in verse 4, he's going to walk us through some folks who essentially picked God. They chose God. And he'll show us how they did that by faith. We'll pick up in verse 4 next week. Thanks for being in here. We won't pick up in verse 4 next week. Because Trey's going to be teaching our Bible class next week as part of wrapping up our marriage conference. Sorry, I'm just getting back into this schedule here. When we get back together in Hebrews, we'll pick up in verse 4. Thanks for being in here this morning.